Hey guys, welcome to another video. Today we're going to talk about should you store your preps in a storage facility, like a public storage place. Many of us who prep and many of us who have limited spaces within our homes, whether it be an apartment, manufactured home, a camper, a regular house where you've got limited space, and you're, you're concerned about having stuff stored securely, conveniently, and be able to get to it. And I've often thought about this, and I'm going to share with you my thoughts. Once again, this is my opinion and some of my own personal experiences that I've had in the past with renting storage facilities. If you are thinking about putting preps in storage, I want to go over some of my tips and tricks. And none of this stuff is uh, earth, shard earth shattering or mind numbing. It, it's all pretty much common sense. You know, prepping is a common sense practice. It is. It's, it's predicated by forward thinking and not flying by the seat of your pants. That's really what a prepper is. Not flying by the seat of your pants. You know, when we were younger, that's pretty much what we did. I can remember a time in my life when I didn't care what was going to happen tomorrow. If I had 20 bucks in my pocket, I was only concerned about what was going to happen that night. It's funny how we progress in our life, and I don't know if it's because of our worldview broadens or maybe we become mature. I'm sure education has a lot to do with it. So if you stay abreast of current events and oftentimes on the channel, you'll see some political content. Guys, this is the context. And it's funny, every time I make a political video, I lose a couple subscribers. It just cracks me up. I mean, you subscribe to a prepping channel and you're going to be offended by current events. What are you prepping for? What's your worldview? What's your context? This is not a channel for hoarders, <laughs> okay? We're not preaching hoarding 101. We're preaching preparation. We're preaching survival training. That's what we're teaching on this channel. If you don't like that, then please unsubscribe and go away. I really don't need you. I don't need your negative comments. I don't need your criticism. And I don't need you trolling. I don't. I'm here to help a select few. Probably 10% of those of you subscribe will probably watch this video anyway. So I'm going to give you guys that are really serious about prepping and surviving some knowledge and some information that's going to help you. So for the rest of the woke culture and for the rest of the sheeple out there that want to walk off the cliff, I'm sorry. I can't help you. I can't help you. And I've never shared this on the channel before, but that's probably the largest reason why I left the ministry. I did. That's one of the largest reasons why I left the ministry. I found that my ministry was more successful preaching and teaching to the lost than it was to the church. So many asleep. So many satisfied with the status quo. So many satisfied with tradition of religious principles and traditions of men. I mean, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. That, that, that was Jesus' nemesis, right? That, that was my ministry. I had a ministry to the Pharisees and the Sadducees. God called me to go wake up dead churches. I pastored nine churches, and they were all dead when I got there. And I would take on these, these pastorates and these churches just for the express purpose of preaching Ichabod. I think the longest pastorate I had was seven years. Was very successful, baptized a lot of people, won a lot of people to the Lord, helped invigorate many churches, many cultures, uh, started a lot of churches. I think I started close to four or five churches, both overseas as well as in the country. I started the first uh, Christian church on a Native American reservation in Georgia. Yep, sure did. And the old stick in the mud Baptist down there in South Georgia said it couldn't be done. Well, God did it. He sure did. He sure did. This channel is here to promote truth. It's here to promote encouragement for those of you who are awake. 
That's my fair notice statement. I'm not here to tickle the ears, guys. I'm not. I got better things to do with my time than sit here and make videos and to become cute and quirky and popular to... For what? For clicks? Nah. YouTube's going to hell in a handbasket. That's what YouTube's doing. I have a marketplace ministry, I am on this channel and I am on this social media platform to reach a very small percentage. If two or three people get encouraged, if two or three people get prepped, if two or three people gain the knowledge that they need to survive, do you know how good that's going to make me feel? That's it. I have a very small cast net, and every week I cast it. Every week I'm looking to increase the fold, and that's my ministry, guys. That's my ministry. Rant complete. Let's talk about storing preps in public storage facilities. First of all, I don't advocate it, just so you know. However, for some of you, it may be a necessary evil. I had to rent um, storage facilities in the past, when I relocated, most of the time it was temporary. For those of us that are prepping, we're probably looking at it from a long-term standpoint. And so I think it's a different application. Storing ter temporarily, you're, you're pretty much uh, conditioned and mandated to follow, you know, that protocol and that process. And it's just one of those things you have to do. And so you have to do the research, and you, hopefully you've made good choices in the past. I look for high and dry locations. I look for remote locations. I look for locations that are in rural applications. For those of you that are living in the city, it may behoove you, and I do touch on this on our SHTF, um, ha what's happened now uh, series. I do touch on how to rent storage facilities, but not into this detail that I'm going into today. But I do look for remote locations. Some people would say, well, why would you drive outside of the city to get to your stuff? Well, chances are, if SHTF happens, you're going to be leaving the city. And what better place to go to than a remote location to get some of your stuff? Let's talk about some of the things that um, I would not store in a storage facility. Food that you need. Food that is not stored properly. You can store food in a storage facility provided that it is in a Mylar bag, it's been vacuum sealed, and you've got it in a food grade five gallon bucket that's hermetically sealed and duct taped. Something that the rodents can't chew through. Uh, if a squirrel gets into your storage facility, uh, he's going to have Thanksgiving again. We have chickens, we feed the birds. Well, I say we, I don't have a mouse in my pocket. Mountain Dew feeds the birds. And she goes through probably 50 pounds a month in bird seed. We were keeping bird seed on our back porch in a garbage can that had a lid that you had to pull off to get to. The the vermin, including the mice and the squirrels, chewed, chewed through that Rubbermaid tub and got into the bird seed. So you got to think about that. If you're going to store your long-term prep food, it's got to be bulletproof. It has to be. So I would probably put those things in, in limited quantities. I'm not talking about 20, 30, 40, 5 gallon pails. I'm talking about 2 or 3 pails. I would probably go and buy me some cheap metal garbage cans after I put them in those 5 gallon buckets. And then I would uh, seal that garbage can, that metal garbage can with the metal lid. And that's going to prevent any varmint from chewing through because they can chew through those rubber garbage cans and they can chew through a five gallon bucket. Okay? So think about that. Hermetically sealed. Everything that you're doing in a storage facility has to be hermetically sealed, meaning that moisture and humidity is your enemy. So I do not store anything that's going to rot or rust. And if I'm going to store something that I'm concerned that may rot or rust, and I'm going to take that necessary step with vacuum sealing, using the absorbent packs, um, and, and doing the best I can with air tightening that product. But 
Never would I store ammunition or guns in a storage facility. Not doing it. I don't have that many guns and I can't keep them with me. So I don't see the need for storing that. And I don't see the need for storing ammunition off-site either. If you're going to store those two things off-site, I would say cache those in the ground somewhere. That would be my advice. Uh, before you put anything into a storage facility, make sure you document what it is with a photo. If a receipt is available for that item, then have that with you. Document it all, take pictures of it, inventory it, and then put that in a little fireproof box in your possession, not at the storage facility, but with you. Store all that information, take pictures of it all, and store it on an SD card and keep that in your little secure document folder in case you have an insurance claim. Now, in the event of an SHTF situation where we're talking about a total collapse within society, then having content insurance is, is, a, is a moot point. So forget about it. But I'm talking about in the event that you have a theft or flood or fire. We had a storage facility here in town recently that caught fire and it took out one whole building. And I'm sure a lot of those people in this particular part of the country in the area that I live in probably did not have uh, content insurance. Most people don't even have homeowner's insurance where I live. So I can only imagine the loss there. Um, here, here's another thing I want to say about putting your preps in a storage facility is that uh, just wrap your mind around the process of that. You, you, you may lose it. You may lose it. So if it's irreplaceable, I probably would not put it in storage if it's irreplaceable. I'm talking about items that would be in redundancy. Okay? Items that, um, that are easily replaced. Items that are not expensive. But that have a value, right? So I have a storage facility. And I store everything in the Rubbermaid tubs. I duct tape it. And the things that I put in that facility, um, I'm at quite often. I would say weekly. It's more of a drop station for me to travel from to and from places. I do a lot of business in remote counties. And I use it also as a drop station for a lot of my business and my tools, materials, etc., etc. So it's more of an off-site um, staging location for me and my company but the things that i do keep in that storage locker are things that i use frequently but they're bulky and they're not heavy but they're bulky and they're just in the way in the house and it's stuff that i use but it's stuff that i don't need to be in my way think camping items tent sleeping bags uh tubs of flatware, stainless steel cookware, stuff that you just, lanterns, I mean, things like that. Things that um, matter to you, things that you use, cots, uh, mattress. We have a big mattress and a platform that we use when we put in our spring bar tent. Uh, the winter well stove, another example. Things like that. Those are the things that, that I'm putting in storage that, like I said, that I don't want to keep on my property and typically I'm going there several times a month and I'm working in and out of that unit to get to those things. So make sure that you do rent a facility that's large enough for you to work it if you're going to be using it as a drop station. So, you know, I know it's a hundred bucks a month. Sometimes you can get them for 50, 60 bucks a month, the smaller ones, five by five by five. But there's a good chance that if you need something in that facility, you're going to have to empty it out just to get to that one item. So try to store your things in the big Rubbermaid tubs, Sharpie all over the outside of them, right on it, what the contents are so that you can at a glance, look at it and know, Hey, that's where all my wool blankets are. That's where all my extension cords are. That's my stainless steel cookware, campware set. You know, I've got three or four different stove systems. Uh, the little buddy heaters. You know where I'm going with this, right? I got three or four tents, seven or eight sleeping bags. Um, I got more stuff than I can enumerate in this video. But my point being is that you put this stuff in these big Rubbermaid tubs and it takes up a whole bedroom. 
So it's easier for me to get to it on the way of my adventures to just stop by the storage facility. Make sure you rent one that has 24 hour access and also is locked that has a secure um, camera system and a touch pad screen. Uh, get to know the person that you're dealing with there. I rented two facilities. In fact, I still rent one in another state and I know him personally and he keeps an eye on my stuff and it's good to know that person you're dealing with get to know that person and become friends with them if you're a friendly person if you're not a friendly person then mind your own business right I think most of you are friendly if you subscribe to this channel chances are you're friendly please be friendly Mountain Dew is constantly telling me that be nice be nice it's hard to be nice when they act like heathens, isn't it? But we have to be. But yeah, about a little, an ounce of kindness, it just goes a long way. Take the extra step to get to know that person. Invest in their, invest in their interest. Invest in their time and talk to them. Get to know them. Be friendly. It'll go a long way. I was storing um, my boat in South Carolina. Or was it Georgia? That was Georgia. I was storing my boat in Georgia. And I had it tarped and covered and secured, yada, yada, yada. And um, they called me. And I had it there all, all winter. I had it there for four or five months. And they called me and they said, we just want to let you know if you're coming down this spring that it uh, looks like one of your trailer tires is flat. Really? Thank you for telling me that. That would have been a bummer to go all the way down there thinking I was going to take the boat out that weekend and only to discover that I had a flat. Um... And then, like I said, check on your stuff. Make sure it's working. Don't just, you know, set it and forget it. Go in there and look at the stuff. See how it is faring to the inclement weather. And to rent these inside facilities, I'm a little nervous about that. I know they're real popular in a lot of the larger urban areas. But the thing I am concerned about in an SHTF event is getting past that facility security system if you got to get into it and there's nobody there to let you in i mean at that point you're you're breaking and entering of course you're breaking and entering anyway but it's going to be a lot easier to scale a fence and cut the lock with a bolt cutter and then obviously the lock that you buy um i can cut it <laughs> okay i can cut any lock within two minutes so Everybody says case hardened locks are the best to buy. Well, they're they're better to buy, but they all have a security rating on them, one through ten. Ten being, you know, bulletproof. Uh, with a lithium battery DeWalt grinder and just a regular cutting wheel, uh, an abrasive cutting wheel, I can cut a case hardened lock in two minutes. I've done it many times. Lost the keys to my locks and had to cut the lock. I got a trailer out there, and I've lost the key to it, and had to cut the lock. It was one of them $40 locks. It, it cut just like butter. So know that. But these case-hardened locks, they're... All a lock is is just to keep an honest man honest. If somebody wants into your building, they're going to get into it. That's why I say uh, document your stuff and then be aware of the fact that you got to be willing to say goodbye to it if you... Um, lose the contents of that storage facility. So I, I look at renting off-site as a temporary fix and I also look at it as an overflow, a drop station, particularly if you're working in and out of that facility then you're probably fine. And then uh, make sure that you're not doing business online, just always online, online. Oh, it's so easy just to pay the thing online. Go in there and talk to these people. Get to know them. It needs to be a local relationship, okay, if you can have a local relationship. And I consider even the two that I rent off-site, out-of-state, local relationships because I know the owners. And they know me. And we get to talk and on a regular basis. And so they text me. They have my number. They call me. They text me. Things like that. So I know in urban areas, it's it's so hard to have that one-on-one -on -one connection with people today. Is it not? I lived in Orlando for about six years in College Park, which was a pretty nice area. 
and there were six neighbors on that street. I lived on Yates Street, if you know where that is in College Park. I lived on Yates Street in College Park. I did not know the neighbor to the left, to the right, or the two across the street, but I saw them every day. Did not know any of their names. And I lived there for six years. I'd get up in the morning, go out to my truck, start my truck. I'd wave at this one, wave at that one, wave at that one over there. I would even talk to them, but did not know any of their names. And that is a very sad commentary. But is it not the way that most people live today in urban areas? There's no sense of community. Even though you may have a community, it's a very superficial, it's what we call small talk. Hey, how's it going? You know, mowing the grass, whatever you're doing out there, checking the mail, washing the car. Hi, how's it going? Going good. Well, it's Friday. Yeah, we're going to go get some pizza. You know, that kind of stuff we say. But we don't really get to know our neighbors, do we? Those of you that live in these urban environments, you're going to have to break out of that routine and break out of those bad habits and get to know the people that you're doing business with and get to know the people that you are trusting to guard your stuff. Okay? So that's it, guys. Those are my tips and tricks and advice on storing your stuff off-site, out of your visual peripheral, and making sure that you keep your stuff safe, secure, Prevent it from rusting, prevent it from rotting. Like I said, don't forget about putting that stuff in steel containers if it's food items after it's been hermetically sealed. Get you some 100 mile an hour duct tape. And um, that's D U C T, not D U C K, because the D U C K is actually a brand of D U C T, which is a pretty good brand. But I can tell you right now, side tip, probably the best duct tape with a T is the Gorilla brand and it's about 10 12 bucks a roll but it's probably the best it's the stickiest I've ever found and it works pretty good and it'll even withstand some moderate wetness it will it stays stuck all right that's it guys thanks for watching what to do with your preps and off-site facility until next time I want to encourage you guys out there to be safe